Welcome to the Latino Business Report. This podcast covers business, people, and issues of the day from a Latino perspective. The Latino Business Report is brought to you by TAMAC, the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce. TAMAC is the leading Hispanic business organization in Texas since 1975. Now for your host, J.R. Gonzalez. And welcome to another episode. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about Payroll Protection Program, a.k.a. PPP. I'm sure a lot of you heard about that, but may not understand exactly what it was. So to answer those questions, we have with us from Prestamos, the Director of Business Education and Consulting Services, Amber Cordova. Amber, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me today. And thank you for joining us. Amber, your visit on the show or your being a guest on the show is very timely. Um, We're coming towards the end of the actual PPP program, and there's a lot of people out there who still haven't applied, and there's a lot of people who are not sure they're eligible, and so the reason we have you on the show is to say, let's talk to these folks. We want to talk to them directly, and if you haven't applied, if you're a business owner or if you're an individual that gets 1099 forms or if you're out there working in any way, you possibly could be eligible for this program. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. Okay, well, let's just dive right into it. And um, can you give us a little bit of background? Now, this is an SBA program and kind of take it from there. Sure. The Paycheck Protection Program, actually, the, the first and second rounds happened earlier on in 2020 over the summer out of the CARES Act. So everything that's happening with the PPP has to do with that original CARES Act stimulus uh, plan. And so the PPP program is a forgivable loan in order for small businesses that are self-employed or have employees to retain employees and be able to continue to pay payroll or to pay themselves as a self-employed business owner. And when we talk about self-employed, we're talking about anybody who files a Schedule C on their personal tax returns. So if you get a 1099 If you have a small business and you file on your own personal taxes, if you're a business that has employees, um, as long as you're not a publicly traded company or have over 500 employees, then you meet the qualifications as a business eligible for the program from size standards. Now, Amber, the first round of PPP, I remember seeing this in the news, and I think a lot of people did. It seemed like all these major corporations were just gobbling up all the money. It's like a small business owner. They go to the bank and the banks were shut. They were out. We have no more. Um, how is this loan different than what happened the first first time around? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the first time around, and actually a lot of people don't realize, but there was already two rounds of PPP. There was the first round that very quickly ran out of funds, and then they reallocated money into the second round. And then this is actually the third round of funding. Businesses are only eligible to get what's called a first draw and a second draw, but there's actually been three rounds of money that have been put into this program. In the past, when this program first started, it was a brand new program. Congress came up with this idea, they made it a law, and they told the SBA you need to implement it. So the SBA had to scramble and very quickly figure out a way to make this program work. And it's very complex. And it did leave a lot of very small businesses out. The rules were not very clear. And by the time Clarity came with the Flexibility Act that came out in June, uh, the majority of the funds were were starting to be depleted and, and the program was ending. This time around, the Biden administration has made, a, made it a point to really support the smallest of small businesses. And they've also removed eligibility for those larger companies, anybody that's publicly traded. And they've also put in a requirement that you have to have a needs attestation. Basically, you have to to justify your need if you're getting over a particular amount. So large corporations that were applying before aren't able to get the same access to the program now. Amber, on the first couple of rounds, for nonprofit organizations, 501c3s were eligible, but 501c6s were not. And from the Chamber of Commerce world, I mean, Chambers and a lot of other organizations out there are 501c6s. So in this round, they're eligible, correct? 
That is correct. 501c6 membership organizations and leagues are eligible. And so they can apply for the same type of, they can apply and it's the same type of criteria as if they were a, a business as far as the rules and regulations. That's correct. They're going to be eligible based on the W-2 wages that they pay to their employees. Okay. Good to know. Now, <clears throat> what I'm hearing about this particular round is that, and you said it, you're focusing on small businesses. Now, according to the government standards, a small business is 500 people or less. I mean, to me, that doesn't seem like a small business. You know, a small business to me is, you know, four to five people, but, but 500. So, so the businesses that are applying now, they're going to have to compete for the monies to those with those larger businesses that are made up of four or 500 employees? Well, the, remember that the limit is going to be 500 for the first draw. And if it's a second draw borrower where they've already received a first draw PPP, the cap is actually 300 employees. But everybody's kind of in the same, you know, the, there's only so many funds available in the program, but there are special allocations based on the number of employees that you have. So there are specific set-asides to help support the smallest of small businesses being able to get access. Can you define the smallest of small for me? So we're talking, I mean, the smallest of small is a, a One employee. owner, owner operator. You, you wear all the hats in your business. Okay. So if you're one employee, two employees, a family owned business with three or four people, you definitely, you definitely can apply and you definitely encourage that they do. Yeah, absolutely. So these are funds that are set aside. And if you don't take advantage of them for your small business, somebody else is going to. And the example that I like to use, uh, and this is probably pretty popular in Texas, is truck drivers. So a truck driver is, is typically driving for a company and they get a 1099. Same thing if you're a Lyft or an Uber driver you're going to get 1099 income and you're going to use that 1099 tax form that you get at the end of the year to create what's called a schedule C. That schedule C gets filed on your personal taxes and it says that you're self-employed and that you have self-employment income. That self-employment income is what you're going to use to get access to the program. So we're going to look at the schedule C and it's going to be based on you can do two options. You can do it based on your gross income, which is line seven of the Schedule C, or your net income, which is line 31 of the Schedule C. Now, your gross income is going to be much higher most times than your net income. Remember, that's a good example. But, you know, here in Texas, not all of us drive trucks for a living, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of us that drive trucks, but not necessarily for a living. <laughs> but with that... Okay, what would you tell a person that goes, okay, <clears throat> I'm kind of self-employed. I, I, I work a part-time job where I get a paycheck. I'm self-employed. Um, I got a little business on the side where I make some money. But at the same time, I, I'm a small business. I, I don't have an accountant. I don't have a CPA. I don't have this type of needed help to apply for this loan. So what can they do? So if somebody doesn't already have their taxes filed um, they're they're going to want to get their taxes filed. And there's some different resources out there. You can even go online and use something like TurboTax and TurboTax will allow you to do it for free. You can walk through. It's kind of a wizard. There's tons of commercials on TV about, you know, people doing it while they're watching TV on their tablet. Tax preparation can be that easy, but that tax form is going to be something that they they need to have before they can apply. And that's going to be a tax form for 2020. 2019. That's a good question. It can be 2019 or 2020. Okay, because for the 2020, didn't the government extend it? It used to be April 15th. I think they extended like three or four months. I know they did last year. I'm not 100% sure if they did this year, but if somebody has not filed their taxes for 2020 and they need to use their 2020 taxes, they can create what's called a draft Schedule C. And if you're not familiar with the Schedule C, it, it's basically a one, it's a two-page form, but you fill out the most majority of the information on the first page. You're going to put your total income, so the total amount that you made, and then it asks you to break down expenses into different categories like advertising, vehicle expenses, rent, and then it gives you the net income at the end. So you take your total income and then you subtract out all of your expenses to get your net income. 
So it's not a super complicated form, but there are additional resources out there if people need help. And we're one of those resources as well. Super. So if you don't have your 2020, you said you can use your 2019? Yep, that's right. And if you don't have your 2019 or your 2020, you're probably in have a, bigger issues in this anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, it's it's not always our top priority. And one of the things about being involved in your business is that you're working in your business and sometimes you don't have the ability to, to focus on things like like taxes, but it is an important part of operating a business. Amber, you're talking about do you, does a person qualify? Can you give us an idea of just some of the basic paperwork that they would have to uh, to come up with? Because I, I looked over the form and it seems relatively simple. Um, so can you give us, the listeners out there an idea of what would be required to actually apply for this loan? Sure. Uh, there's not a lot of paperwork that you have to provide. And this is not based on any kind of credit at all. Um, you will need to provide your social security number or your ITIN, as well as your employer identification number. You'll have to provide your personal address. You'll also pr- have to provide an ID, a photo ID, and that's just to verify that you are who you say you are. You'll have to provide proof that your business was in operation in February 2020. And that can be something as simple as providing your bank statement for your business for 2020. Or if you're an Uber or Lyft driver, you can provide a copy of the trips that you did in the month of February. You can provide invoices or copies of checks that you received. So really just that documentation to show you were in operation and were actually a business in February 2020. And then you'll provide your tax return for the business and any kind of wage documentation that you have for any W-2 employees. And that can be something like your quarterly payroll reports or a lot of the payroll providers are creating what they're calling CARES reports. And those CARES reports show what your total wages were. And that's pretty much the requirements of the the application. What if you're an individual, and this is not me, of course. I'm asking for a friend here. Uh, Let's say you owe the government some money. Can you still qualify for this PPP loan? Yes, that's a great question. This is its own unique program. Now, one caveat to that is if you are in a delinquent status and, you, and you're and you in delinquency with the federal government or you've caused them a loss in the last seven years, they will decline the application. But if you're on a payment plan, if you're working with them and you're not in a delinquent status, then you should be fine. Okay. Oh, I was asking for a friend. That's what I was doing. Well, that's good to know. What are some of the other... Uh, you've been doing this a long time and... Um, from every everything I hear, you're very good at this. So I'm going to ask, what are some of the other common obstacles or common misconceptions about this type of loan program that you've bumped into? Well, the first thing that it's important for people to know is that this is a loan and it, it it's a forgivable loan. So what that means is that there are requirements for ways that you use the funds and you use them correctly, then you're going to apply for forgiveness. If you forget or never apply for forgiveness, you're going to have to pay the loan back. But there's a really long period of time before that has to happen. Let's start. Okay. Let's say it's a loan. What's the interest rate on that loan? If you don't receive full forgiveness, then it's a 1% interest rate and a five-year term. Okay. And if you do receive forgiveness? Then it's completely satisfied and you'll get a letter saying... You're you don't, all done. You, you don't, don't have, have to pay, pay anything, anything back. You don't have to pay anything back. <laughs> all right. So let's kind of take that step. Now, you said there's a period of time. So let's say I, I apply. I go apply for a PPP loan. I get it. It's $25,000. So I see the $25,000, and I know that at least 60% of that money has to be used for payroll, and the 40% can go towards rent or PP e equipment or other things necessary that that you have outlined. So I get that. When would I have to start paying back that loan or how soon would I be able to um, find out if I get forgiveness? So once the funds are deposited into your account, your covered period starts and you get to choose whether what covered period you want. 
anywhere between eight to 24 weeks. So you can say, I want to use my $25,000 over eight weeks, or you can say, I want to use my 24, 25,000 over up to 24 weeks. Once your covered period ends, and again, that's your choice, how long you use it, then you have 10 months from the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. Once you apply for forgiveness, you're kind of in that waiting period with the SBA. And right now it's taking about two weeks for them to make a determination. I don't know how that's going to change over time. And as you know, they get more backed up with people with applications, it might take longer. They might allocate more resources. Um, but right now it's happening pretty quickly. You'll submit your application for forgiveness. It'll go to the SBA. Your lender makes the recommendation to the SBA about forgiveness. So say you have a loan with us at Prestamos, we'll work with you on the front end to make sure that you've used the funds properly, that you understand how to use them, and we'll help you complete the application for forgiveness. And we'll make sure that it's done in a way that we're able to recommend full forgiveness, unless of course you don't use the funds correctly, then we can't. Um, but we'll recommend full forgiveness and work with you and the SBA to do everything we can to make sure the loan gets forgiven. That's great. Uh, that would be nice to get a forgiven loan. Yeah. And we're seeing um, actually everybody that we've submitted through for forgiveness at this point for the loans that were taking place over the summer, we have a 100% forgiveness rate at this point. So I know that's a major concern. People have a lot of distrust over the government or they think this program is too good to be true, um, but it's working as the way it was intended to. And Amber, you hit it right on the head there. Too good to be true. So you you folks at Prestamos offer all these services, but yet we're getting it for free. How does that work? Why? Well, this is uh, our, our, our taxpayer dollars hard at work. Um, the SBA is a division of the government and the PPP loans will come from, you know, tax, tax repayment. And we don't charge anything to the borrower. So if you apply, there should be no application fee, whether that's through us or any other lender. Nobody should be charging you a fee to apply for a PPP. Nobody should be charging you for a PPP unless you don't get for forgiveness, then you will have to pay the loan back. Um, all the services that we have, we, we get a service fee from the SBA to do this loan process. So it covers our overhead to take the applications, process the applications, and all of the, the assistance that we give. So you guys get funded through the government, through, through, through tax dollars. So the SBA pays you as a nonprofit organization to actually provide the service to the community. Is that correct? That's correct. We get paid a servicing fee to make sure that because the SBA can't handle the volume of loans through the PPP program, they've outsourced it to lenders that are certified to work with the SBA. So any lender that is doing a PPP loan gets a servicing fee to go through the whole entire process. And we're talking from application all the way through for forgiveness. And Prestamos has been certified. How long? How long have you guys been in business over there? Or how long has your organization existed? So Prestamos has been a CD, CDFI for over 20 years, and then we're a part of an, a larger nonprofit organization, Chicanos por la Causa, which is the, over a 50-year organization. Amber, I have another question. Let's say somebody has a business, and the owners of that business are not U.S. citizens. They're here legally, but they're not U.S. citizens. Can they apply or not? Yes. If they are here legally, they do not have to be permanent residents, they just have to be here legally, and they have an ITIN number as opposed to a social security number, they can use their ITIN to apply. They can use it to get access through the self-employment. So say, for example, you're here under whatever program or a visa or whatever the situation might be, and you have a business and you generate business income, then you can get the owner compensation replacement because you're self-employed. You can also own a business and have W-2 employees that you're paying W-2 wages and get access because you have employees. Okay. Well, let's take the other side of the coin. If you're here running a business, but you're not totally documented here legally, can you apply? If you are a non-resident 
business owner and you have employees that you pay W-2 wages to and your W-2 employees live in the United States, then you can get access to the program. If you are not a legal, you're not here legally and you have a business, then I would not recommend applying because you, you have to be here legally in order to get access to the program for yourself, for that self-employment compensation. Okay. Now you brought up something that made me start thinking, how about the individuals out there that are the self-employed folks that you're talking about? Uh, you mentioned earlier the Uber drivers, the hairdressers, the day laborers, the people that, that just go from job to job, especially in these difficult times when a lot of people have been laid off and a lot of businesses are closed. Can they apply individually for this? You can't apply as an individual unless you have that Schedule C that shows that you have self-employment income. So if I'm working and I'm getting W-2 wages from an employer and I get a W-2 at the end of the year, they're not eligible for the program because they're just considered workers. But if you get the 1099 and you're filing the Schedule C on your taxes, that's considered self-employment income. And you actually get self-employment tax off of that as part of your tax return as well. Amber, you have an individual here. For the past year, because things are so tight, they've been going from job to job. They've been doing odd jobs. They haven't really been working for anybody, but they've been kind of their own self-employed person. Would they be eligible for this program or not? Yes, they would. And they want to make sure that they're filing a Schedule C as a part of their tax return, because that's the the real key is whether or not they're filing that Schedule C. So all the money that they've made from maybe odds and end jobs, maybe they've done some lift, maybe they worked for Postmates, maybe they picked up some day labor type positions. You're going to take all of that and add it together to create your Schedule C to say that this is my self-employment income. And it's based on that self-employment income as opposed to W-2 income that you get when you work for somebody else who's an employer. So actually, this program is just about for everybody. I mean, if you're from a from a a day laborer, if you will, you know, just doing odd jobs to a company up to three or five hundred people, um, just about anybody can apply. Yeah, just about. If you have self employment income, you are pretty much eligible to apply for the program. And how much you earn kind of determines what your replacement is. So if you're self employed your payroll to yourself is going to be your owner compensation replacement. And that's why we're looking at self-employment income, how much you made to determine how much you're eligible for. Okay. Now the deadline is coming up of um, March 31st, but we talked about and maybe extended, but still you highly recommend that don't take a chance. And if you're going to apply, apply now and get that paperwork in. Yes, absolutely. You are working on a deadline of March 31st right now. And remember that all of the application documents have to be in and submitted to the SBA and we have to have your approval back. And that can take several days once we've submitted the doc documents. Now it, it could potentially be extended, but at any point, the program could also run out of funding. So just because it's open until March 31st, if the funds ran out sooner because everybody got their applications in, the program would end sooner. So the sooner you apply and the sooner you have all of your documentation ready and you upload it to whatever lender you're going to use, the better because you can ensure your place in line for the program. Okay. I understand that there's some major banks out there who have already kind of closed, closed their doors to new applications. Yes, I've heard that Bank of America put out a statement saying that they want to be able to get through. They have 30,000 applications in, in process, and they want to make sure that they're able to get through all of those applications and submit them before the deadline. So the larger banks, obviously, they're national. They're, they're going to have a lot more applications than working with a lender like us who's a little more regional or focused on smaller businesses and doesn't have the type of reach that a Bank of America or Wells Fargo might. Okay. Well, Amber, I want to thank you for coming on uh, coming on the show and talking about this. I know I've learned a few things. I hope that uh, some of the folks out there have uh, learned a few things and have been encouraged to go ahead and apply for this uh, this last round of loans. Is there anything you'd like to add before we we call it a call it a wrap here? 
Well, first, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, business education and business empowerment is my greatest passion. So anytime I get to talk about ways to help entrepreneurs and small businesses, I, I love it. So I'm thankful for that opportunity. And I just encourage everybody, if you have a reason why you think you shouldn't apply, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me, reach out to the show, um, look for resources and apply. You can apply through our website, prestamosloans.org. And it's a simple, easy application. You'll get to work directly with a human being that will actually talk with you, answer questions. And the worst thing that they can do is tell you you're not eligible for the program and you've lost a little bit of time. And we're not talking about a ton of time, maybe 15, 20 minutes of your life. Um, but if you could get this forgivable loan program, which if it's forgiven, it's, it's free money to you, then you should take advantage of it to make sure that you can continue your business operations. Well, you look at it as free money. I look at it as me applying for the money I've already given the government for all these years, and it's about <laughs> time they share some of it back. That is one way to look at it for sure. Well, you know, it, it helps me sleep at night, Amber, so that's the way I'm going to look at it. Amber with Prestamos, thank you so much for being here. And folks, uh, if you like the episode, if you like the information you've been getting, please make a comment, like us, follow us, and we'll see you next time.